Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 650. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's March 9th, 2021. All right, welcome to the Anglican world of news. Sometimes we sit down and we have nothing to talk about. And sometimes, sometimes a former prince and princess will sit down for an interview on Oprah and George and I get to talk about it and it will fill the whole show. But that would be boring. You could just watch the interview yourself and laugh and go, wait a minute, they were previously married. How is that possible? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Talk about that in a minute. Before we get too far, please like this episode, share this episode, comment on this episode. You're going to want to comment on this episode. Lots of great comments on the last episode. Lots of email stories on certain buzzard blizzard, uh, buzzard blizzards, bu- buzzard bishops in, in last week's uh, episode. We appreciate the inbox full of stories. That was kind of cute. Um, and if you're not subscribed yet, now is your chance to subscribe to Anglican Unscripted, you do that on the YouTube channel. There's a red rectangle. You click the rectangle, up pops a little bell. You click the bell and you will get instant notifications every time there's a new show or so. I'm told, doesn't always happen. That's the love of technology. George, how's your week going? Just great. We op- we reopen after our second shutdown this Sunday mm-hmm. with uh, two in-person services and four online services. It'll be exciting to see how many people we get back. I have no clue what, <laughs> how many are going to come. Well, that's it. I mean, it's going to be a, uh, a slow growth back, especially depending on the age of your population. And as the vac- vaccinations take hold, the CDC just said, if you've been vaccinated, you may now gather with other vaccinated persons. Yay! Yeah, so <laughs> do you have a little card at the door? You must be vaccinated before you come in here? Or uh, what's your policy with your church? Don't ask, don't tell. Don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> That's the Florida policy. Jill and I well, went... I can- I can't get that. Neither you or I can get vaccinated right now. Not yet, no. Uh, in Florida. Yeah. Jill and I were Because we're not 65. Yeah. Jill and I were at St. Augustine last week on Saturday. And after touring the town all day, we went to a local restaurant called Fish Camp. And we walked in there, and it was packed. Shoulder to shoulder people. No mask. The staff had their mask below the chin. The bartender wasn't wearing a mask and i'm like i don't think this bar cares i don't think the people uh going here care the, i think everybody is so covid um uh weary that they've they've given up they know there's a vaccine and they're going to take their chances until they get their shot so well, kevin you're you're fortunate you didn't go this weekend because this weekend it's the traditional start of spring break so it's Daytona right. Beach and Fort Lauderdale and Clearwater Beach are going to be shoulder to shoulder with uh, college kids. That's true. And it's already it's already uh, uh, seeing the news uh, stories of uh, of the beaches. They're already packed with the, the kids on vacation. So, which is good for us because I've had I have parishioners who are in the tourism industry, charter charter uh, boat captain and. You know, he's in danger of losing his boat because sure. he hasn't had any business for almost a year. And it's, it's, the reopening hasn't come to the... It's, we've always been open, but the change in public attitude that it's safe to go to Florida uh, will keep some people from going under this week. Yeah, which is good. I mean, the businesses need it badly. And I think uh, the world kind of needs to change their mold set from fear to optimism and mm. we, we've certainly seen that in the uh, uh wall street lately um that people are refocusing not just on tech stocks but economy stocks fuel stocks and we'll just have to see what happens from here but uh, we've had this fear mentality now for a whole year my wife just reminded me she's been out of her work location uh in seven days for a whole year you know that, that they kicked her out so um it's been when a long suspend when does her suspension end? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, they don't know. They, they, different companies are offering different options. Uh, most of my customers have all of their 
um, cust- their employees back because they're retail or education based. But a lot of these corporations now are saying like, why are we renting expensive uh, space when we are statistically getting better performance out of our workers who are working at home that want to continue working at home and will work harder at home in order to stay at home. And so they're like, I, we're not going to go rent $13 million Manhattan pro, uh, uh, properties per month when we can just have people work from home, pay them less because they want to work from home. It's, it's, it's a strange times, George. Let's move on to our first story. And no monarchy is immune from every history lesson I had back in high school. I just remember if you were a king and a queen, your kids were going to turn out pretty rotten. And then there's the grandkids and the nephews and uh, all, all of monarchy and relatives and family will always make the news because the news is built on this tabloid system, especially in England. And we get to hear about it through the American voice of Oprah. She sat down with Harry and Meghan, had a interview. I guess clearly no questions were off grounds. And uh, except maybe uh, who's Harry's real father. But we'll talk about that some other time. So here we are, George. Um, she spilled the beans. The big story, Anglican wise, is she says we were married three days in a private ceremony in the backyard by Archbishop of Canterbury Justin Welby. Yeah, I'm. I have. I, I, if I remember correctly, that can't happen because of the Church of England rules. You're absolutely right. I must confess that I did not watch the show. My mm-hmm. wife did. I was in the garage sorting screws into pickle jars one of my uh, more passionate Sunday evening hobbies. Um, But after it was over, Susan uh, said to me, uh, and my wife is a very astute person, Mm -hmm. and uh, she she reads People magazines and things like that, so she knows who these people are. And she's a lawyer. And she's a lawyer, too. (laughs) And she said, you know, I've never seen such foolish, venal people. Uh, They just are silly yes um and so she said but and so she gave me the highlights and i didn't think anything of it went to bed the next morning i'm reading in the papers all oh, the archbishop of canterbury is in trouble and all of a sudden all these american newspapers are becoming experts on english canon law and and so i thought well i better watch the replay and see what it's all about and as kevin mentioned megan uh, markle megan windsor excuse me uh, said that she and Harry were married at their home three days before their uh, public marriage at Windsor at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. And now, Meghan Markle played a lawyer on TV. She's not a lawyer. So she really is not someone who I would take definition seriously from. The Archbishop in England, a wedding must be in a consecrated prop place, a church, a chapel. It oh, cannot yeah. be at a, can't be at a hotel, can't be at the beach, can't be at your home. Which is different. Here in America, I can call up the presiding bishop, Michael, yes, Kevin, you owe me a favor. Can you come to my property or the beach and perform a wedding? I'll give you a bottle of wine as, you know, in exchange, And uh, but I want it done this weekend. And presiding bishop, Michael Curry, probably would say yes he could say yes he could come and perform the wedding outside here at the beach in florida and it would be all perfectly legal you can't do that in england yeah so first off it it it, it, you can't get married at home right second you need two witnesses and and in the interview it said what was just the three of us and uh, prince harry then sang a version of just the two of us as a song uh, instead of the three of us of Justin Welby and the the Windsor couple. Well, you need two more people to make it legal. You need witnesses. Because the most famous part of the marriage ceremony is, does anybody object? That's why it must be held in a, according to canon law. Mm. And, and marriages must be public to permit people to come and object in case you have a previous marriage. Mm-hmm. And so, and then the, to follow up to say that they had a second marriage at Wind, at the St. George's Chapel at Windsor, 
you can only get married. You c you cannot remarry. You cannot redo a marriage. You can have a blessing of a consecrated marriage, but it's already done. And so the Archbishop of Canterbury was approached by uh, the Church Times and various news organizations, and their spokesman gave the answer that he always gives on these sorts of questions, which is, well, we don't discuss personal and pastoral matters. So the Archbishop of Canterbury, in some of the lesser, uh, uh, I was going to say lesser intelligent newspapers, is saying that he flouted the rules of the Church of England and just, you know, no, he didn't do that. What he did was a private blessing for two rather silly, selfish people. And rather than have uh, Megan bring in one of her crystal guru people or, or some swami, I'm sure he should, you know, Okay, I'll grit my teeth. I'll just bless him, and then we'll do it properly uh, on, well, at the church. You are a historian. I love history. If anything, we know that when a monarchy calls the Archbishop of Canterbury and says, "Can you do something?" the proper response, if you want to live, is yes. But but Rowan <laughs> Williams said no. That's right. Rowan Williams to his credit, refused to marry uh, Prince Charles and uh, Camilla Parker Bowles mm -hmm. in a church because such a marriage was not be legal or lawful under the canons of the Church of England. So uh, Charles's uh, marriage to Camilla took place at a uh, public register's office. Um, the Church of England will say no. It said no to Edward VIII uh, in the 1930s. You cannot marry Wallace Warfield Simpson. It said no to Queen Elizabeth's uh, sister, Princess Margaret, when right. she wanted to marry uh, Group Captain uh, Townsend, I, I forget his first name, in the 50s. That's right. Yeah. And so the Church of England is very good at saying no. And Justin Welby didn't say no to and i think he was trying to be pastoral and just trying to make it go away but why would he trust megan markle she's estranged from her family now she's estranged harry from his family mm -hmm. they've thrown prince charles under the bus oh somebody said this racist comment but it wasn't the queen or prince philip who's left or his brother charles. or his father <laughs> charles so it's charles with the big bullseye on his head. And Port, I, as a good American, I really don't care about the royal family. But there's a certain point when I just feel badly for somebody. And who I feel badly for is Prince Charles. Meghan Markle, I just, I don't want to say I have contempt, because that's not kind, but this is just such a self-entitled, silly girl. She um, does remind me of some Old Testament biblical characters of the uh, female persuasion. So, uh, she, I'm, you know. I'm, I'm reminded. I, I uh, Mark Twain had a wonderful book, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, and he had a line that the nobility uh, would, as a rule, only achieve poverty and obscurity if left like their betters to their own efforts. And this is a you know, without the title, Harry would be just another dim bulb in the firmament of this world and Meghan Markle would be another B-list actress who's trying to climb the ladder of fame and fortune uh, the Kardashians do it must much better than she does but uh, this is you know the world that she's in uh, well if you want to look at the money that exchange hands Oprah is said to have made 17 million dollars just in this interview Okay, she's said to have financially helped out Harry and Meghan when they first came over. I don't know if we've ever checked their travel visas, but, you know. Um, so there's always money to be made. Uh, Americans and Europeans are suckers for these types of interviews. We're going to sit down and we're going to have um, a, a wonderful talk with Harry and Meghan. But when I'm watching, you know, the clips that I saw, it's like watching Lance Armstrong right in front of uh, Oprah having it a diana moment and so it's just like <laughs> here we go again one of the things i read uh, melanie phillips is a wonderful columnist in the uk but she did get something very very wrong mm -hmm. she wrote about how appalled she was by how disloyal harry was and how silly megan was 
But then she said she was more annoyed with America for eating this up and, and believing everything that these people said. She needs to get out more because I don't think, I've not seen any polling in the United States about, do you believe Harry or do you believe uh, Prince? You know, the silly people who, who like this sort of stuff are always gonna like it, but to say that America loves Harry and Meghan Markle yeah. I'm sorry, you don't know. That's not yeah. the country I know. Hollywood does. Hollywood uh, does. The, the academia does. But as far as the average American, they don't really care. I didn't watch it. You didn't watch it. Uh, my wife didn't watch it, but she read about it and said, I better pay attention. So, you know, uh, we will indeed, thankfully, because we love Anglican News, hear, hear and talk about Harry and Meghan again. Um, maybe after his DNA test, but uh, we shall see what happens. Um, there's more news to talk about. A little bit of follow-up to the Dear Guy Anglican letter that was posted. Um, it's still going to reverberate. Justin Welby has finally discovered Lambeth 110. Yay! Um, it doesn't apply to white provinces. It applies only to African provinces and provinces of the global south apparently uh, at least that's what i'm getting because uh, there's been violations of lambeth 110 since the second year it was established and this is the first mention i've heard of it from justin welby he has come down hard on the archbishop of nigeria let's talk about it george well i've got a strong opinions on this issue yeah, we both well yeah you helped write it <laughs> Or type it. Uh, well, the, what Ke <laughs> friends, what Kevin's referring to is I was the typist for Lambeth 110. I was a clerk at the 1998 Lambeth Conference, mm -hmm. among a bunch of other people. And I have to tell you, Professor Stephen Knoll was the prince was one of the principal authors right. of Lambeth 110, mm -hmm. uh, as well as Mar and Martin Minns. I mean. I wasn't. I was the typist. I got the Chinese food when they were hungry. So just to give you my, I was, they were officers. I was a sergeant. Okay. Um, this saga of the dear gay Anglicans has just gone from, from farce to farce to farce. Uh, it, troublemakers within North America to make themselves look good to the Church of Nigeria exaggerated and either purposely misled or misstated what the ACNA believes or deliberately lied so as to improve their standing. See, we really do need to have another Anglican province besides the ACNA because you can't trust the ACNA. Now, granted, uh, there's one squirrely bishop, but there's always going to be a squirrely bishop. That's I, just... I like the squirrely bishop in question. I don't think he likes us, but... <laughs> you're, you're always going to have a squirrely bishop, but as an institution and as the ACNA is not going soft or anything like that. So the Nigerians, without picking up the telephone to call Foley Beach or any of their people in the U.S., listen to self-interested parties who gave a stilted account of what was going on. And the Nigerians blow up and... If you read the Nigerian letter from a Nigerian worldview and perspective, they said nothing wrong. Uh, now, its language was not what we would use in the West, but we speak the same English, but we don't speak the same English. We don't. We have, yeah. a, we have, you know, we have a failure to communicate, as Struther Martin once said in Cool Hand Luke. Okay, so the Nigerian response was over the top and ill-advised and it was factually incorrect on a number of points many it points opened, it was factually incorrect and it opened them to the criticism that they were abandoning La that second clause of lambeth 110 which said that uh, we welcome all people uh into the church that they're no outsiders we don't exclude gay people okay so that and as soon as that settled Justin Welby, followed by the Me Too Bishop of York and the Bishop of Chelmsford, Bishop elect of Chelmsford, and the, so the liberal bench 
got off, got out, and stood up on their high horses and said, Oh, how awful you are violating Lambeth 110. This is just dreadful. We reckon we we want you to be just like us and love everybody and follow Lambeth 110. And as Professor Noel, Stephen Knowles said in his uh, piece, which we published on Anglican Inc., the hypocrisy of Justin Welby is, you know, either the lack of self-awareness or the hypocrisy is extraordinary. For 20 years, uh, the Global South and the ACNA and people have been saying, and conservatives within the Church of England have been pointing to absolute violations by the Episcopal Church, the Canadian Church, the Brazilian Church, and the Church of England is going down that road. And Justin Welby is always making accommodations, always excuses, always finding uh, a way not to act. And here we have him taking a PR opportunity to build his capital with the gay lobby in England. Because the words he says will have no effect whatsoever in Nigeria. It will only further estrange the global south from Justin Welby. And so for this, this whole episode, is a series of people acting either out of ignorance or short-term gain. You had the young man writing this thing who really doesn't have the standing within the Anglican world, and for some reason some people of prominence put their name to it, which caused the problem. So shame on those, frankly, unworldly people uh, for, for being idiots. Then you have people well, uh, in the I United would say States. for not for not seeing things in a global context. Well, it's part of the yeah. problem of academia is yeah. that you're the issues before you are so minor and unimportant hmm. that you uh, are used to fighting to the death over things that don't matter. There's no such thing as moderation in academia. No. Um, the most vicious fights you'll ever see it are in faculty uh, committees. <laughs> but so here you've got some people acting silly then you have some people acting deviously trying to use this to their short-term advantage in the u.s to make the acna look bad then you have the nigerians uh look being <sighs> triggered and looking like idiots i mean i was reminded and you know there's enough bad blood in history that kevin do you remember the scandal at the GAFCON conference in Nairobi when half the Nigerian delegation walked out without paying their hotel the bills. Sure. <laughs> I do remember that. And, uh, and, and Martin Minns had to scurry around and make things good. Because, and he did. You know, he, and he did. Nobody got, no, but you know, that was not in Martin's budget. No. Uh, paying other people's hotel bills. Yeah. And so this is another, this is a bad act from the Nigerians. It was it considered. And then we have Justin Welby doing another short-term political point scoring rather than trying to improve the Anglican world, rather than seeing the best in other people. Everybody along this line has seen the worst immediately and acted foolishly. And it's interesting because you and I always have been complaining the last five, six years because there is never letters um, anymore from the Global South archbishops or the bishops from Africa or the archbishops from uh, Africa when there's big news here in America. Why don't they establish uh, when there's another bad thing happening in the Episcopal Church or General Convention? They're not sending out letters. They're not you know, okay. doing the PR things that they used to do. Now they finally do it and they get shot down. That would be part of it. But I would approach, I would answer that differently. Okay. And it's because of the passing from the scene of Martin Minns and Peter Akinola. I think so too. You had, you know, Martin Minns and Peter Akinola were a team that could put their hand to a piece of paper and give a fantastic document. They had a great sense of timing. They knew what works. They knew what didn't work. And when both of them retired and stepped off the stage at different times, they're successors have not been up to snuff um, in this area. I'm not saying that they're lesser people. <laughs> no, no, I'm no. just saying in the greater world of, of inter-Anglican global communication, communications yeah. of 
strategic thinking. Mm -hmm. Strategic thinking, you can't beat Martin Menz and Peter Akinola. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I would add Bill Atwood to that level too. But when these guys are not the first line and you've got other people at the first line, you're seeing the junior varsity team fumble when they go play the first string. Yeah, we've had a big fumble those last two weeks. And I too, now, and I, I just, I, I say this as a journalist, observer, historian, looking at the big picture, when things go bad, it usually goes bad because it started to go bad in the seminaries, in academia. When you lose the seminaries, you, lo- you start losing a lot really quick. That may be where you want to have some accountability. Um, just an observational point I wanted to make. All right, so we have. But let let, let me jump in and I say, because right. I do want to. I agree with you, Kevin. Mm-hmm. But I think the two seminaries that we're talking about, uh, Trinity Seminary and Neshota House, are blessed with really top-notch leaders, Laurie Thompson Absolutely. and uh, Woody yeah. and uh, Woody I, Woody Anderson. Um, yeah. It's not. This is a hiccup, but it's not not uh, it's not destiny. No, it, gosh, no. They, they, yeah, we talked about that have, before. Yeah, we, we, the, mean, the ACNA is not folding, and the ACNA is not going to split over this. The ACNA and Gafcon have a marvelous history in their ten years of accountability from within. I expect the same. Yeah, and and the seminary leaders that we see out there are really top notch guys. Yeah, but you just don't walk in. And within the first year or so, make everything happy and nice. It takes time to build the institutions. All right, so let's move on to the Equality Act. Um, we have a new administration. This administration is, for all intents and purposes, a little bit more liberal than the Trump administration. A little bit. Yeah, yeah you probably measure it in millimeters. Uh, in a such, they want to have some redefinitions of terms and to put um, policies and positions into place to help those people who support them and financially supported them and voted for them to get into office. And in the 21st century, we are redefining gender and we're redefining what it means to be uh, a man and a woman. It's now a bio man or bio woman. Um, because we have too many genders to choose from. It's not just female, male, it's everything in between and outside of those bounds. And we want to, according to Biden and his administration, make that legal so that if by chance a man showed up for an interview wearing a dress and called himself by a female name and had legally changed um, his gender from his biological identity, he is protected by the government. And you can't say, I'm not gonna hire you because you call yourself Lucy and wear a dress. That is called the Equality Act. If that passes uh, the Congress and the Senate and gets signed by the president, that kind of redefines everything. It redefines the rights of every institution, including the church, including education, small businesses, large businesses, and government jobs. We are now to the point where we are going to redefine what it means to be a person and personhood and who the government protects and doesn't protect. For the longest time, since the beginning of the Constitution, the government has been required to protect the church. There's always been a division between church and state, but there was always a written clause that the church is protected. People were protected. Your speech was protected. You were allowed to say, within reason, you can say fire in a crowded theater, but you had the right to protected speech, whether it be political, religious, or anything else scientific those three protected speeches religious um educational and uh scientific are now under this new act now protected i am not allowed to refer to a male biologically and call him a man 
using science, I have to refer to him only as the gender he or she requires me to refer to them. So science speech is now, for the first time ever, not protected. And that's the big, big change here, is we're throwing out empirical um, identities and empirical definitions in regards to the Equality Act. And I think it's time you and I had a little talk about that because, and we'll probably get Alan involved too, this changes everything. This act is so scary that France says, hell no. We would never, we would never have anything like this. I mean, and, and, and to France's credit, a long time ago, they started putting le and la to every item they saw. You know, every object uh, is identified by a gender already. They do not want to have to go and redefine everything. Same with, uh, you know, some other languages. So here we are, Americans in our, in our, in our woke-topia, trying to figure out what are we going to do now because this will probably, you know, Congress, no big deal, it'll pass. Senate, maybe, maybe not. I thought for sure the Supremes would deny this, but the Supremes recently had a transgender case come before them and they approved it. So what is going to happen now, George? Well, the Supreme Court declined to hear declined the transgender to hear, thing, but leave, did, leaving in did, place the pro-gender, the, 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 the Connecticut uh, mm -hmm. fiasco. Well, what's the Anglican, what's the Anglican context? Are we changing the... Uh, the uh, parameters of the show? No. no. Um, I brought this to Kevin's attention saying I wanted to talk about it because I haven't heard many Anglican leaders speak about this, pro or con. Um, there's not been the presiding, there may have been, but I missed it, presiding bishop saying how this is the most wonderful thing. It's a new manifestation of the spirit. Yuck, 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 fill it in. Nor have I seen this uh, being attacked by uh, conservative Anglican leaders until this past weekend I sat down and listened to Bishop Bill Love of Albany's retirement sermon. Mm -hmm. uh, February 28th was when Bishop Love retired and he gave, he preached at a sermon on that day. And I'm very proud of Bishop Love because he wasn't maudlin, he wasn't, well, woe was me, isn't the world mean? Uh, Bishop Love preached about many things, but he preached about the threat to the Equality Act upon traditional Christians. Uh, traditional Christians, Muslims, Jews, any religious person uh, who holds traditional ethical values would be discriminated against under law. Mm -hmm. It would punish faith-based organizations such as charities and schools. Um, and some of the things it would do, and it would force girls and women to compete against boys and men for limited opportunities in sports. We've talked about the Connecticut where uh, these two young boys won 16 of the uh, first place uh, trophies for Connecticut high school girls sports. And got the scholarships that were- And got the scholarships yeah. that were reserved for women athletes. Mm -hmm. um, girls would now be required to share locker rooms and shower spaces with biological males who identify with women. Mm -hmm. But in the deeper picture, it removes women and girls from protected legal existence. So if your daughter, uh, who was an engineer, was uh, privileged to uh, have scholarship or a hiring because she was a woman in a male-defined uh, field, that no longer exists because a man who can claim female identity would have every much of right to compete for that scholarship. So it basically removes women as a, as a protected class from the law. That some of the other things that risk mandating taxpayers to fund abortions, uh, which is a whole can of worms. But we, it, that's, we've already been funding abortions all through the Biden administration, the Biden, the Obama administration. So it would bring we, it, we, it, we, it would we, bring it back, back. But, but it would bring it back as a right, mm -hmm. not just as the new administration's policy. Right. It basically would take away the ability. Let's say Trump gets reelected, he couldn't pull it back without a legal challenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, it would require doctors and healthcare workers, people in everyday life, to support gender transition. Uh, oh, Canadian, what's that guy? Peterson. Uh, uh, Jordan. Jordan Peterson, I'm sorry. That's right. 
uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, rose to prominence mm -hmm. when the University of Toronto wanted to discipline him for not using uh, the right pronouns, according to the woke people. Um, at what was an academic fad will now be a legal requirement. It affects me um, in the sense that uh, from time to time we rent out our parish hall uh, to host functions uh, to rake, make some money. Um, now, let's say the uh, Planned Parenthood, there isn't one around here, but Planned Parenthood wanted to have a fundraiser and they said to me, we want to rent your parish hall or the local Satanist chapter wanted to rent my parish hall. I could not turn them down on the grounds that their views conflict with our Christian beliefs and our teachings. If I offered public account, it changes the definition of a public place. Mm -hmm. Churches now become public places, forcing us not to be able to choose whom we rent property and space to. Um, it, at the end of the day, it puts all the the, the, the rights of free speech and free association, free conscience and free practice of religion under the government's thumb and requires us to assent to new beliefs about human identity that are contrary to the beliefs I as a Christian, uh, Jews, many Jews, Orthodox Jews, many M M Orthodox Muslims believe. Well, and, it, but, it, but it's, it's more than that. It's not just contrary to religion. It's now contrary to science. Non-believers as well. You're right. Yeah, but it it's contrary to um, empirical evidence. You know, empirical science, empirical testing. How on earth can I verify this person who claims to be a woman is a woman, and should compete against other women? Empirically, we know that we would do that by testing chromosomes because that would guarantee that I would know that this person has the same chromosomes as the person they want to compete against. Yeah. They started with this in the Olympics in the 60s when they these did. Russian and East German <laughs> shot putters uh, uh -huh. uh, they look like girls. And guess what? <laughs> Some of them weren't. They were not. Weird. <laughs> and how did we know? Because of DNA te chromosome testing. Chromosome testing. So, you know, I would and, hope if this passed that the, the Supremes would stop it. You know, but, but it would take years to get to the Supremes. Now, part of... Now, the way our system has worked with judicial activism over the past two or three generations, uh, you give an inch, they take a yard. Mm -hmm. And for me, as I think about this, and I thank Bishop Love for really alerting me to this, because I don't really follow this sort of politics. Uh, I, uh, well, and, but to me, my thinking is the act rec fails to recognize the difference between a person and the actions of a person. Now, what do I mean? A person has ethical, this has ethical and social ramifications. In other words, a person is identified by you know, science, but now this is no longer a, uh, it's a subjective definition. Well, I can now be black. I right. can, it, in other words, it's not gonna stop with, I can be a girl. No. It's going to stop with, I can be black. I can, Kevin. I do you can know? Be a dog. I'm really not. I'm really not in my mid fifties. I'm <laughs> actually nineteen. You're nineteen. So, I want Social Security. I'm seventy two. <laughs> you know. In other words, the, the the it changes between what you are as a person and what you say you are by based on what you do. And there's a difference between a person's dignity and integrity as a human being, as a soul, and the actions. Well, now hold on. That's exactly what critical race theory and wokeism is. It's the war between subjectivity and objectivity. There's a war going on. And are we going to talk about the squirrely Anglican bishop again? Because this, <laughs> no, no. He gave it's a speech <laughs> back in this to the hilt. Man, you guys got to get it moving. But I digress, Kevin. I interrupted uh, you, know, you. I'm sorry. And so, no, no. Right. So we're 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 watching and participating in the objectivity subjectivity wars. And um, if we lose this war, there's you know very few battles left uh, for Christians and scientists and people of reason to fight. 
reason is the biggest thing that we'll lose here. Not just Christianity, not just science, but the ability to sit down and contemplate right and wrong. And from an Anglican wars perspective, mm -hmm. I don't have any problem with people on the left, say in the Episcopal churches, because the Episcopal church for a long time, some of its leaders, not all, I'm an Episcopalian, I'm not including myself here, <laughs> do not believe in ultimate truth. We are moving towards truth. We're mm -hmm. finding truth through it's our experiences, journey. through journey. our emotions. Yes. The traditional Anglican way already knows the truth. The truth has been revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And there are no new truths. There are, new, there are new shadings and things, but there's no new revelations of truth. In other words, Gene Robinson was famous for saying, God is doing a new thing by allowing him to be a bishop and, and doing homosexual. He would say the Holy Spirit's doing a new thing. Holy Spirit, yeah. Holy Spirit's yeah. doing a yeah. new thing. Yeah. This and the traditional Episcopalians, the Anglican Church in North America, was founded on saying, no, God is not doing the new thing. Jesus the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow, not a Jesus that changes with every passing fad. And for the ACNA and for traditional Anglicans to be silent when the, when the same battle that has destroyed, not destroyed, but has devastated the Anglican way is... Uh, is facing us as a nation um this is a call to arms it is i um i call on gafcon and the acna to stand up and say no we're not gonna support this in any way shape or form and the episcopal church i call on you to stand up and uh, i as am well. standing up well i'm sitting up <laughs> i'm still. sitting up and stand support you know it, it, this is you know the equality act will be a horrible piece of legislation which we have the Supreme Court now that we want. They're conservative to look, to look at this. They just had an eight one decision the other day. They're you know conservative enough to look at this and say no, we're not going to take away people's rights in order to um, promote a uh, extreme minority position. We've we've switched from several generations ago of requiring uniform assent to one ethic, mm -hmm. now to requiring uniform assent to a different ethic. And the arguments that uh, the uh, free speech movement in the 60s was propounding are now the arguments that uh, conservatives like me are propounding, <laughs> because we're both fighting for the same thing. It's just that the man, the institution, has swung from one side to another. Yep. All right. So final story we have time I, we, we're, we're up here at 43 minutes you you want to talk about hickville or you want to do that next week oh let's just mention it because it's uh it, it's an eye-rolling story well uh, it is because well I, I <clears throat> give a quick background i have some 34 3500 people i follow in my facebook feed i'm not pointing at anybody i'm not going to name names but i would say between four and five percent of those people post stories that are critical of taking the vaccine some will post every story they see where somebody has a bad reaction see this is why i'm not going to take the vaccine some will post every conspiracy story they see where um, every vial is made with an aborted fetus <laughs> you know and so, so that's about of my facebook feed four or five percent of them one percent sadly family cousins long distance cousins not, not close family uh and another one percent um conspiracy theorists uh, two one to two percent of those are conspiracy theorists who actually have pictures of them with aliens on their page so yeah uh, understandable uh, another one percent of that are what i would say believing people people of faith the Washington Post thinks all people of faith and evangelicals are anti-vaxxers. And I thought, yeah, let's talk about this, George, because I'm not a hick. <laughs> Even well, though you we both... In the, you, you do live in the sticks. <laughs> we live in... We, live in the, we now live in the sticks near Hicksville. So... Uh, Michael Gerson, 
uh, wrote an opinion piece in the Washington Post, which essentially said that evangelicals are stupid and historically have always been stupid. And now their stupidity is shining once again because all evangelicals are opposed to the COVID vaccine uh, for the reasons Kevin mentioned, either for paranoia or for uh, uh, any intellectual purposes. And I don't know if I should be surprised or not that one of the Washington talking heads says something that is so disconnected from reality. I have a bunch of stories I have to get to. One of them is that the Archbishop of Nigeria, Henry Ndukaba, uh, is pushing people in Nigeria to take to get the COVID vaccine. No, it is not the mark of the beast to have a vaccination shot. Um, evangelical leaders in Southeast Asia, uh, you can't say that Singapore are not evangelicals, the Anglicans there. They're they are encouraging all of their members to get the vaccine. Um, now, you can have a personal opinion as to whether I want to take the Johnson to Johnson or the Moderna because I have moral reservations about how it was produced and this and that. That's, that's different from the Washington Post uh, view that us people between the coasts who live in Webster, Florida, or in Lecanto, Florida, or in Hooterville, uh, are just stupid and don't like don't want to take it even though our betters tell us to but this is what we have that passes for educated opinion in the major newspapers of our nation well yeah broad brush discrimination is the epic coin used by the New York Times, by the Washington Post, by the LA Times. I mean, that's how they became famous, is by uh, putting people in a category and keep, keeping them in a category for as long as possible. I'm breaking out of that category. I'm going to get the vaccine. I'm going to be the, the hick that gets the vaccine because I live in a community here in Florida, uh, the all Class A RVers, all 65 plus, and I'm one of the minorities that hasn't had my vaccine yet because I've, I've not aged into it yet. Uh, when it hits 55, I'm going out there to my local CVS, rolling up my sleeve and, uh, and say, give, give, me the, give me the COVID shot. Because I watched uh, a good family friend suffer her whole life from polio. Before the polio vaccine uh, came to market, uh, she caught it and she had to live in a wheelchair her whole life. And all she needed was, you know, these vaccine which came out like three or four months later injected into her arm and she could have avoided that we have wiped out diseases smallpox polio and many others because of uh, mass vaccinations first time we went to africa kevin uh, oh god yeah <laughs> i remember i had to get i had to get a yellow fever shot and a whole mm -hmm. bunch of it it was the yellow fever that i remember because that really really it does hurt. it's it's the big and needle. they gave me a yellow fever passport yeah so you and i could go to tanzania or zanzibar or mm -hmm. south africa or zimbabwe wherever it was mm -hmm. um so i have no i don't consider it a mark of satan that i have a yellow fever passport mm -hmm. uh, that allows me to enter countries because i've been vaccinated for these communicable diseases yeah, I, um, I went to the Waterbury Travel Center um, where they give you all the, you go, where are you going? And I listed all the African nations I was going to be traveling with the next year. And she takes out all the vials that I'm going to need, you know, little shots. And um, then she gave me the pills. And the, the pills were the antibiotics. And she goes, when the people you're traveling with get sick, start start swallowing these and you'll be just fine my good friend george conger got really sick <laughs> it was in tanzania wasn't it <laughs> amoebic dysentery yeah and i'm popping the pills i, I had to get sick <laughs> kevin is drinking bottled beer but cans of soda and having a steak burned to a crisp george is having uh water and a salad you had the salad and that's right <laughs> Mm -hmm. Stupid, stupid me. I, I've been trying to lose weight, but guess what? I lost a lot of weight, <laughs> not too. because of dieting. It worked. <laughs> now, but let me also say this. Um, I had a classmate in high school who was a thalidomide baby. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Some of you may not know what I'm talking about, but his father was a, uh, uh, Greg is first name. I won't say his name. I'm sorry. Greg, uh, his father was a, an obstetrician in the early 1960s. And thalidomide was a new drug that helped women with morning sickness. And it was given to his mother and to help her with morning sickness. And Greg was born with missing a lower, uh, he didn't, his foot was attached to his knee on one leg. It was missing. He was deformed. Right. And that was a consequence of thalidomide. It caused limb deformities. And there are, so, there. It, but for those people who weren't pregnant, who took thalidomide, thalidomide, there's no problem. You can't get thalidomide anymore. Right. So, and I know I have friends who have immune deficiency, have autoimmune diseases, and any vaccine basically causes them horrendous physical consequences. So my point is that I don't judge people if they're fearful. Uh, my daughter's a nurse, and because she works uh, in uh, with COVID patients and in healthcare institutions out West, she was one of the first people to get a vaccine and she had to think long and hard do i want to take this vaccine because could it possibly interfere with because there were some studies that said it may cause placentas to separate from uh the woman's womb in birth and laura who's not married and who's not pregnant said that's not a risk that i think uh, is live to me but for my colleague who is married and wants to have a child I can see why she wouldn't want to do it. So each of us need to come to this in an examination of our own health and our own conscience. But the event, but the Washington Post story says we don't have consciences, we don't have intelligence. We just do be, do what I don't know. Uh, with Rush Limbaugh dead and Donald Trump out of office, who do we listen to, Kevin, for our marching orders? Unscripted. Uh, unscripted. Anglican unscripted. <laughs> you listen to George and Kevin. <laughs> Oh my gosh, how sad would that be? All right, well, that's a, a full 52 minute show. Uh, I hope you guys learned something. Uh, I don't know if we'll do a Friday show because we covered so many topics, but we'll see. Yeah, now, I don't know, people. Yeah, you know, I know you guys are suffering from snow up north, or it's cold or windy and rainy. Down here, I've discovered that uh, February and March are pollen season in Florida. We get yellow snow. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> I left my bike outside. Yellow. Car. Yellow. I, I'm driving a yellow submarine now. It's it, Everything's yellow. and uh, So uh, I know you were suffering last week from this. Uh, I've been every night is the is clinics before bed. And, you know, I, I, I feel for the people in winter. But this, this, this Florida uh, allergy season is horrid. Well, in for our for our uh, out of staters, you foreigners out there, foreigners. Florida has zones. South Florida doesn't have oak trees; it has palm trees mm -hmm. and tropical vegetation. They don't have this problem. Central and northern Florida have oak trees and cedar trees, and we the live oak trees give off a yellow pollen, and it and it. You come outside in the morning, and your car—you could—it's it, like snowfall. You it's, could write your name on the windshield, <laughs> and and when it's particularly bad, it causes me sinus headaches. And mm. and Kevin is out there riding his bike, breathing this stuff. Oh. So you're, why you're not dead, I don't know. <laughs> no. oh. But you don't. But you don't get it on the beaches. You get it in the inland portions where we hicks live. That's true. So we'll, we'll see how we feel on Friday if. We'll probably get some blowback from the show. We always do. Maybe we'll do a show on that. Or sh we should do a show where we just read the comments. That would be a show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, I just got a text from my daughter. I have to answer. Oh, thanks for watching. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 650 of Anglican Unscripted.